Hi, my name is Lisa Allistway, and on this channel, you will find a variety of inspirational and informational videos. My guest this week is Dr. Arthur Kaplan, who is a bioethics professor and the founding head of the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU Grossman School of Medicine in New York City. Dr. Kaplan is also the author or editor of 35 books and more than 800 papers in peer-reviewed journals. His most recent books are Vaccination Ethics and Policy and Getting to Good, Research Integrity in Biomedicine. I will be linking his website down below for your reference. Welcome, Dr. Kaplan. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy that you're here today. Um, before we get started, can you just kind of give us a working definition of what bioethics is? So there's always been ethical disputes in medicine, and doctors have argued about everything from should they wear a tie or a bow tie, uh, to how to address patients, to confidentiality issues, and so on. But in the 1970s, pressure began to mount on the health system, as crazy as it sounds, because of rising costs. I'm laughing at that because we longed for the days when we had those costs. But nonetheless, people began to say, can we afford to do kidney dialysis, this new thing called transplants, and other procedures? There were issues coming up about uh, how do you get organs from people to transplant if your heart technically can be supported by machines, then how do you shut the machines off to transplant a heart? Or for that matter, how do you ever shut the machines off at all unless we have a different way of thinking about death? What mm -hmm. is death? Mm -hmm. And that ultimately, by the way, became brain death. And we had many, many other questions. Should we make babies in test tubes? in vitro fertilization was just getting underway. Mm -hmm. Those drove interest in ethics and the medical profession basically said, these are bigger questions than just doctors mm -hmm. deciding whether to wear a bow tie or a long tie. Mm -hmm. so we were kind of invited in and that was the birth of the field. It later okay. went on to look at many issues, even today, international issues in research, assisted suicide, questions about nurse, patient, doctor relationships, end of life care issues, COVID man vaccine mandates and on and on. So it's basically become the ethics of not only medicine, but all of healthcare. Yes. And so looking at kind of like the background and the history of it and the significant events that we've experienced, um, I know you said it started in the seventies, but it would it also like have its uh, genesis, like starting with the Hippocratic Oath? Well, a lot of people like to point back to the Hippocratic Oath, and I do think medical ethics begins there, not bioethics so much. Medical ethics is sort of what the trade group of doctors decide how to behave, what they want to do, what their limits are. And yes, that began way back then. Other people will point to the Holocaust and uh, medical experiments there on uh, hapless victims, Jews and Romani people and political dissonance and so on. But sadly, even that, those events did not really get bioethics going because we did terrible experiments in the 50s and 60s after the war, so did other countries. If you will, it was the Tuskegee study where African-American men were identified as having syphilis, but were not given penicillin, even though people knew it would work because um, they wanted to study the course of the disease. Mm -hmm. That research ethics controversy broke in 1972. So that's mm -hmm. why, again, I say most of the bioethics issues, research ethics and that sort of thing, the broader look, even today, climate and how that affects health and the ethical choices we might make, it's really a 70s phenomenon. Okay, great. So that, that kind of clears up the distinction between medical ethics and bioethics. Uh, so for the average person, why should they be concerned about bioethics? Well, you know, a lot of the issues that bioethics examines, let's just say GMO foods, should we genetically engineer plants or animals so that either they pollute less or you get more nutrition or they're cheaper. And many people have to make decisions. Am I gonna eat that? Am I gonna buy that? If you own a restaurant, am I gonna sell that? <laughs> Um, that's a classic bioethics issue, which has direct implications for all of us. And mm -hmm. while the bioethicists have opinions, 
about that. Ultimately, you get a political or a consumer choice answer to that kind of question. The bioethics people try to lay out all the facts, all the issues, so you can make a better informed choice, but it's still a public choice. Similarly, do you want to be an organ donor? So mm -hmm. we get faced with that question. Um, it's not just one that doctors decide because all of us have to decide, are we going to check that box or go into the state registry? Do I want to be in the bone marrow registry too, which lets me help somebody who needs bone marrow as a living donor? Public questions, individual choices of behavior. And obviously with our fights about vaccines, whether you're going to get one, you're not going to get one, what's the policies? Again, those aren't doctor decisions. Those are mm -hmm. public policy decisions. So there are a lot of our questions that mm -hmm. impact everybody and everybody has to vote for them or decide what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. So I imagine as a bioethicist, it can be very challenging in trying to weigh both sides of the issue and trying to come up with what's maybe the best uh, solution. How do you go about some of maybe the strategies for that? So when I'm looking at an issue, we always tell our students bioethics to be uh, on target depends upon the facts. So, um, if you're uh, gonna take on one of these issues, we always tell our students the first thing is get the facts as best you can. Now the mm -hmm. facts don't always decide things. You might say, mm -hmm. look, uh, my chance of getting or dying from COVID is low. I live in a rural area, I don't see that many people. The vaccines have some risks, they're very safe, but there's always some risk with every drug, pill, or vaccine. So I'm not gonna do it. But you wanna know what the facts really are. Is it worse still riskier to get COVID and have problems than it is to get a vaccine and have a small degree of problems? And I actually think it's worse to get COVID by the facts. But even there, that doesn't necessarily tell you what you're gonna do. So then you move on to say, well, what are the ethically relevant aspects? So vaccines can protect me, but they also can protect my neighbor or my grandmom who doesn't have an immune system or somebody who has cancer and is under treatment and they don't have an immune system. So they need to be protected by me getting vaccinated. Question, what's my duty to my neighbors? Other issues, who's paying for these vaccines? Um, do I get them free? Do I have to pay a lot of money to get them? That could certainly be a relevant choice in a time when many people are pinched or having a hard time earning a living. So. Where do they want to put their resources? Mm -hmm. There are issues that come up about, am I going to travel? Am I going to go to an airport? Am I going to go to a concert? Am I going to try and use restaurants? How big a distribution do I put others at risk or catching it? So start with the facts, figure out what are the relevant moral questions, and then ask the question, well, what are my ethical duties to my neighbor? I do think we agree that we should protect the vulnerable. We should try to help people who could be harmed by COVID, let's say. Mm -hmm. We don't hear that argument enough. I think it tends to be, I don't want to do it because I don't need it, or I don't want to do it because I don't consider my, or I'll accept the consequences for me of not vaccinating. But the bioethicist is going to say, well, what do you owe to others? How do you weigh that? Shouldn't that come into the equation? And then there may be special groups, healthcare workers, police, ambulance people who have special duties because they're dealing with sick people and they don't want to drop out of the workforce. And so they may have, quote unquote, special obligations. Mm -hmm. So you go from facts to what are the relevant moral issues to what are the principles that we could agree should guide decision making. And that's roughly how it goes. Okay, very good. So what would you consider the uh, most controversial bioethics issue? Well, pre-COVID, okay, <laughs> it used to be um, assisted suicide. Okay, so yeah, let's talk about that. that. Legal and is that something people should have a choice of? Aid from the doctor in dying, should the doctor be able to give you a pill or a shot that would help you die? And if so, for whom? In the U.S., a number of states have decided to allow that to happen for terminally ill people, defined as people with six months or less to live. They also say you have to request it yourself. I can't go in and say, you know, it's time to say goodbye to Lisa, um, give her the pills. 
you have to ask for them and you have to take them. I can't give them to you. Um, these are all protections so that no one is pushed or rushed to end their life. Mm -hmm. You have to make the request usually two weeks or a month apart so that you know you think about it. It's uh, giving you a chance. Canada and Europe have been thinking a little differently. They've been debating, could you help people who have mental illness who suffer? They may not even be competent. What about babies who have terrible diseases and their parents say, we can't fix them. I don't want them to suffer. Could we help them to die? And they're also thinking, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're terminally ill or not, say in Belgium or the Netherlands, if you suffer a lot mm -hmm. from some medical condition, ALS, then maybe we should be able to help you. So that's how the debate has been going. And there are many people who, for various reasons, sometimes religious say, it's not your place to decide when your life will end. God should do that. And there are other people who say, suffering in itself, we can partly control it, but it's part of the experience of life and death. And we should accept it. We shouldn't necessarily say, well, is it suffering? Mm -hmm. um, then, I, then I'm not going to put up with any of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people might say it's redemptive. Some people turn to the lessons of Jesus and think about his suffering on the cross and say, well, that's part of what we should all be doing. And then other people look at that and say, oh, I, I don't buy that theology and I don't think suffering has any real point. Mm -hmm. So that used to be pretty contentious and we were arguing that and some states were moving. All of that slowed down because the number one contentious issue right now is COVID and <laughs> what to right. do about it. Right. And it absolutely has engaged all of us in arguments about vaccine mandates, mask mandates, um, whether we're selfish if we use a booster and don't give it to people in other countries. That's that's absolutely the driver today. Um, let me ask you one more thing about because in the news we hear about these suicide pods in Switzerland. Yes. Yeah. What are you, how would a bio medical ethicists look at that? Do they see that as a medical device, not a medical device? How is that viewed? In the US, it would be a medical device. And weirdly, you'd have to test whether putting you in a pod and then putting in uh, deadly uh, aerosols would be acceptable relative to uh, doing what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I think these things are efficient. They seem to work. By the way, side issue. In US states that still have execution, this may become the way to execute somebody. Should that mm -hmm. be the way to do capital punishment rather than electric chair or you know, other firing squads and this sort of business? We seem to have shortages of lethal chemicals around. The states that have capital punishment are struggling. The introduction of something like a suicide pod that you get in to die could be actually seen first in our prisons, not in our hospitals. Mm. Um, but the questions come up, one, is it too easy? Is it like an attractive nuisance? You're going to see people buy them and just get in them because they had a bad day or they got divorced or yeah. somebody fired them or whatever. Um, there's no real control like we've tried to have here. You got to wait 30 days and you have to talk to a psychologist if they think you might be depressed. And those sorts of things a little bit go out the window because there's the device and it's yours to use as you want. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Um, so you were mentioning the vaccine. Let's touch on that a little bit. I think that's you know a current modern day controversial topic we're currently having. Um, but I'd also like to maybe tie in, do bioethicists also look at the economic impact of some of these choices? Is that into the formula as well? Yes. So when you look at who's doing bioethics, I came from a medical philosophical background. Um, there are other people who come from uh, nursing and they get a degree in bioethics, but we also see lawyers and law professors getting involved because you need part of the facts is, well, what's the law say now? If it's illegal to help somebody die in the state of Oklahoma, then if you're going to have assisted suicide, you have to change the law. We need to know that. So there's a big role for the law. Social scientists come in. We often poll people and say, do you think you had adequate informed consent when you got your vaccination or something like that? And economists come in because distribution of resources, what's fair, what's just, do the poor get their vaccinations? 
if we have lockdowns, what's the cost in terms of mental health for kids or just everybody? Is that too big a burden, even though it may save some lives? We just can't afford that, which by the way, seems to be the trend these days in policy. I don't hear anybody saying what they did pre-vaccination about lockdowns or quarantines. It's like, well, we're not going to do that. And you sort of say, why not? And it's because the burden economically is too big. Mm -hmm. Shuts down the cities, huge mental health costs. So we don't have a lot of economists who come into bioethics, but yes, there are some. I mean, most of them do their own thing and we read their papers, but there are some who cross over and enter the field. So big interdisciplinary field. People, by the way, ask me, how do I become one today? There are a lot of schools, NYU is one, but there are many that have master's degrees in bioethics. That's your ticket. Usually mm -hmm. takes a year and a half to two years to finish. These days, that's kind of your license, whatever mm -hmm. field you're from. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started, there wasn't a field, so I could just walk in because we were, <laughs> there weren't any bioethicists. We were kind of making the field, but we do have, you get a degree and you can, you know, people say, well, how do you test people? We have absolute consensus on many issues. What's brain death? What's required to get a good informed consent? what's required to get a valid organ donation. That's the sort of stuff you'd be expected to know. Mm -hmm. Do you have to accept the answers? No, you could still criticize, but mm -hmm. you'd be expected to know what the ethical resolutions are right now. Okay, and so they would be hired by hospitals, do research, teaching, consulting, um, and those types hospitals, of Hospitals, and sometimes weird places like philosophy departments. There are a few people who have jobs in law schools, health law, bioethics law, and believe it or not, this is kind of interesting, a lot of pharmaceutical companies have started to hire bioethics people to help them design their clinical trials, uh, set them up so that they recruit fairly or uh, do a good job with confidentiality or data sharing or informed consent. We have a lot of people who uh, wind up working at places like the Gates Foundation or the mm -hmm. Ford Foundation doing international issues about distributing resources. Some people go on to careers in journalism. There are a few of my students who are reporters or producers with an interest in the ethics angles on many of these questions. Okay, very good. So let's talk about another, I think, current issue in bioethics, and that is the, all of the technology and technological innovations and the issues around them. Um, in particular, uh, you know, people can get a new nose, they can get new cheekbones, they can get new chin plants. So, you know, moving forward, like if people would like chop off their limbs to get a robotic arm or a leg because it's faster and stronger, like what's stopping, you know, the technology taking over parts of our body and what is considered actual human. So what are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah. Well, that is a big evolving area in sports. So we've seen an individual, Oscar Pistorius, who had artificial legs, who wanted to compete with everybody else in the regular Olympics, not the Paralympics, not the Special Olympics, the Standard Olympics. This was the guy who later killed his girlfriend, so he's not going to be competing soon against anybody. But yeah. issues came up about, well, what about artificial limbs? Another big issue that's coming up, transgender uh, men who become female and compete against females. There's right. a couple of these people who are knocking away all the records in uh, swimming because they're just stronger, even though they claim to have transitioned to female, they're still, they've got some biological advantages from being born as a male. Yes. And we all know about blood doping and the use of technologies to increase your ability to handle uh, oxygen at high altitudes or get more uh, durability by having uh, blood doped. And there are people who use steroids and weightlifting. We're constantly checking pro players in the NFL and other sports. Baseball had a steroid scandal. So your question is part of a huge new area of bioethics. How far can we go? I mean, we don't tell people you can't take vitamins. And we don't tell people you can't have your own chef, even though having well-designed nutritional meals might give an advantage over somebody who doesn't have that. Say you're 
you know, playing basketball against a very poor African country and you have a trainer and a weight room and a great diet, you'll mm-hmm. probably do better just with those things, forget about steroids or mm-hmm. some mechanical things than they're going to do. Yeah. So I can only say at this point, there are sort of two answers emerging. One is if you get an advantage that is so obviously unfair, that it undermines competition. And so some of these transgender uh, athletes seem to have too big an advantage. And I suspect they're going to not be able to compete down the road, they're going to get restricted because they're just swimming or whatever the sport, weightlifting more than the usual female range of behavior. Or MMA. We see it already Mm -hmm. because we divide many sports by weight, boxing, Mm -hmm. wrestling, you know, little people don't wrestle giant people. Right. We think it's unfair and that's Mm -hmm. just natural difference. So I think we'll see some of that start to happen. The other big issue is If uh, you have to take uh, a steroid or something like that, and it's risky, then people start to prohibit that. So if it damages your liver or harms your long-term health, we tend to be coming down pretty hard and saying that is something you can't use. But do I think in 20 years, there'll be vitamins that athletes will take to improve their performance? I do, because that standard shifts. Mm-hmm. What about these brain chips to make us smarter? Way overdue. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we need them desperately. Um, we have them already. They're called our computers. They uh, basically, if you watch anybody under 35, they're on their phone constantly. It's not in their head, but it's through their it's eyes. It's on their body. It's the brain and mm-hmm. they're in. So when people ask me that, I laugh and say, we have a loose connection to the machines now. Mm-hmm. Will there be more of it? Yes, absolutely. My, my nephew here has an Oculus, which is the thing you go into a virtual world. Yeah. Really intense. All games yeah. are going to look like that. But someday I can imagine treating people for mental illness in that universe or say you're going to prison in that universe. You stay home, but you have to keep this thing on your head Ooh. or we chip you in your brain. Those aren't the issues for you and me, but they will be for our grandchildren. That is quite interesting when you think about the virtual world. And, you know, there's some of people who would like to cue us up and get into that pod and into that matrix, you know, yeah. today. They'd like to see us in the metaverse. Well, I remember Star Trek, the fans of that had the holodeck. They had a whole fantasy mm-hmm. world that they could create on the ship, very realistic. And I, I'm sure we're going to see that. I, not next year, not even 10 years, but it's coming. Yeah. And the issue starts to become, I'll just make up one. If I'm uh, a rapist, can I go into this world and do what I want and not actually hurt anybody, but I can do what I want. Mm. If I'm someone who uh, really uh, is incorrigible, can I be sentenced to go there for whatever crimes I can't stop doing? Uh, child molesting or something and I have to say I don't serve my sentence in a prison I go to the virtual world where they try to condition me not to do that and Mm -hmm. but I think that's coming when people say oh brain chip I'm like it's coming and I think the chips may also be used to enhance us learn faster learn more quickly you know something funny we don't think of it this way but a vaccine is an enhancer it boosts your immune system Mm -hmm. that's what it is and the idea of enhancement is there in sports medicine. It's there in some psychotherapy where people say, well, I'm not, I don't have a mental illness, but I'd like to uh, cope better with the yeah. world. I want to improve. Yeah. Um, and I think you see plastic surgery is rife with improvement, right? People don't say, oh my goodness, you got a breast enhancement or you have lip, whatever it is, fillings. And people can compete in beauty contests with that stuff. Yeah. But, but the other to say those celebrities who do it, we shouldn't admire them because they're artificial. We just sort of mm-hmm. move on. But but to all those things, there are side effects that oh, yeah. might be rare and maybe not as common, whether you're talking about vaccines or plastic surgery or the virtual world. There are side effects to, to all of these things. Yes. And there's also force and coercion and some of I don't want to go in the virtual world. <laughs> Send me to prison or you know, yeah. chip me so that I can't have these feelings. 
and yeah. that's faster and you know i don't want to go through rehab for, that way i can see it by the way for those of you who are uh, not so interested in crime what about treating alcoholism what about treating depression these are things where the judge might say 90 days in virtual uh, isolation special world not only do we know you're going to class to uh, stop drinking or whatever stop using drugs we've chipped your brain and you're going to go to counseling and i'm going to know that you're in counseling because you're in the world we have no choice mm. very it's so fascinating because you know that's far in the future and it's not really something because i'm generation x it's not something i mean i remember the world before the internet so like all this is very sci-fi and futuristic and yes. you know very interesting i know there's pros and cons and arguments to it all and I guess it just comes down to like studying it as a bioethicist because that's going to generate the policy moving forward. So right? for people with a little military background, bioethics is like the airborne advanced troops to these issues. We get there, we think about them. Then lawyers and policymakers arrive, the main force, and they mm -hmm. decide what's a regulation, what's going to be prohibited, what's a law, what's going to be a benefit or an entitlement. But part of our job is to look forward and anticipate mm -hmm. what would we do? The whole field, by the way, is called neuroethics that we're talking mm -hmm. about. It's like, what do oh, we do okay. with chips and virtual reality and other ways to alter the brain? Um, to, you know, I can imagine people saying, well, one thing you can't do is link a human brain to an animal brain. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be prohibited. It seems too weird, uh, mm -hmm. just too, too strange. Uh, and others saying, no, I'd really like to know what it's like to be a deer, or I really want to yeah. understand I'm studying foxes and I want to know what they're thinking when they go out there. So that's so, pretty sci-fi too, but. So you have like, you know, the rules and regulations and laws in the United States, but that doesn't prevent other countries, China case in point, doing their own experiments and their own stuff moving forward, even if it's unethical. Weirdly, the ethics has a better chance than the law. Most countries won't respect each other's laws. There's some international, right. I don't mean it's nothing, but yeah. generally speaking, if China says X and they wanna do it, an experiment or something, and we said, no, we're not gonna do it. Case in point, research with embryos. We don't do them here because of attitudes about personhood and embryos and abortion. Chinese don't see it that way and don't care. Mm -hmm. they'll, yeah. they'll sacrifice embryos and experiments and not think a minute about it. Yeah. The ethical argument though, is something that they listen to and they don't like being shamed or uh, mm. having someone blame them or having someone hold them up as pariahs. And so even though you may think, well, ethics, what can they do? Turns out it's relatively powerful in international discussion because no one likes to be known as the ethical criminals or the unethical, it has some force. Okay, so the... Um... In China, I read that they had the you know the CRISPR, the gene editing, and they created a baby in 2018 that was gene edited. Allegedly. Um, allegedly, right? But there's a lot of ethical dilemmas because you're really manipulating the DNA. You can actually cause disease. You know, snip the wrong gene. Um, where do you see the CRISPR going in that in yeah. that technology? The CRISPR is, for those who don't know, a kind of fine-tuned. Uh, ability to do surgery on our DNA. You can take out little messages, insert new ones, and it really has a future immediately in treating genetic disease. We're going to see people fixing sickle cell or uh, cystic fibrosis or uh, other mainly genetic, primarily genetic diseases using these fine-tuned genetic instruments, which you use by engineering a virus to insert something into cells that aren't working right. So that's not as controversial, it's controversial, but not as controversial when you're doing it on a person because they don't pass it on. Mm -hmm. Where CRISPR gets controversial is when you're trying to do that in an egg or an embryo. Mm -hmm. Then you're doing something that somebody else will inherit and they can't give their permission, they don't even exist yet. Um, and will you take more risks? Will you start to do what we were talking about before, which is enhance? not just when the Chinese experiment was done, the researcher who said he did it, and I don't think he did anything, I think it was phony, but what he said was, I'm gonna give more resistance to HIV AIDS 
in these babies because their mm. parents have been found to have HIV and maybe I can protect them from getting it from the mom or the dad. Hmm. So it wasn't a bad argument. I just don't think he knew how to do it. I don't think anybody can do it yet. That kind of genetic snipping uh -huh. is harder in an egg or an embryo to do. And, um, but will it happen? Yes. Mm -hmm. The fight will be, how do you permit it in terms of enhancing or improving? These yeah. disease treatments? Yes. Yeah. But the, the whole designer baby thing, <laughs> that- I'm gonna say, uh, you know, people don't like to hear it necessarily, but looking at how much money people spend to improve their kids now, tennis lessons, get them into the right kindergarten for $80,000 a year for kindergarten, make sure they have a tutor, make sure they travel to Europe so that they're, that's all enhancement. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, some kind of natural human condition and the most competitive people parents spend more and do everything they can to give their kids a break. They're taking Kaplan courses to go to mm -hmm. college and boost their scores. We saw a big scandal mm -hmm. where parents were paying off people to get their kids into school. You don't think those parents would try enhancement? Mm -hmm. They oh, could do it? Probably. I do. Yeah, I do. I, yeah, I do too. Um, so let's talk about another leading issue and that is on reproductive technology. I know let, for abortion, you know, at some point in history, it was illegal and frowned upon. Then in another point in history, it was legal. And then in another, and then it keeps coming back. So that's what I think is very challenging about this field is that you have, you know, changing viewpoints depending on the point in history you're in. Well, you know, you also have changing viewpoints depending on the science. Catholic Church was not anti-abortion until embryologists using microscopes discovered embryos. <laughs> they didn't, they, they said whatever happens before the mom feels the baby quickening, and this was the Muslim tradition too, is okay, you can end the pregnancy. There's yeah. nothing there basically that counts. Yeah. Then they began to see more scientifically and they said, hmm, looks like there may be human-like features in some of these embryos at, you know, I don't know, 15 weeks, 20 weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. They began to understand miscarriage a little more. So those fetuses began to get examined. Abortion, I think, has been uh, troubled by two things. The more you see the baby, how many of us now have as our first baby picture an ultrasound of the baby in utero? Mm -hmm. That wasn't true 40 right. years ago. Yeah. Now you see the baby. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, that gives it more moral standing because now you're, whatever it is, even if yeah. it's baby, you're seeing something. The people who take the pictures in medicine, by the way, say there's your baby. Mm -hmm. They don't say there's your possible baby or your, yeah. you know, potential baby. They say, that's your baby. So mm -hmm. that shifted our thinking for many people. I think also there's been a uh, ability to save younger and younger premature babies. So it used to be, say in the 1960s, if you could save a baby that was born at 28 weeks, that was a miracle. We're down to like 24 weeks and that gives more moral standing to, mm. even if you're a believer in Roe versus Wade and viability, it looks like viability is moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the abortion debate partly is what theologians think and what thinkers think about uh, sexuality and the duty to help uh, an mm -hmm. unborn person, but it's also science. Science yeah. is driving some of the ways in which we think about, look, one fact that, influences me is the vast majority of naturally conceived embryos don't work and fall out of the woman's body without her even being aware. The natural mm -hmm. abortion rate is very, very high. It's well over 50%. So mm -hmm. if somebody says to me, life begins at conception, I don't agree. What I believe is all lives have begun at conception, but not all conceptions, the majority don't produce a life. Most of them mm -hmm. fail. Yeah. So how do you weigh that in your thinking becomes a yeah, it, it's a very complex issue and it's a big one. I don't really want to go into great detail here, but thinking from a bioethicist, I know you always start with, like you said, facts. And to mm -hmm. me, that's like the intellect, but then you're talking about moral. And to me, that's like the heart and the gut. Mm -hmm. so you're trying to get all of those things in alignment and addressing these issues. And that's why abortion is so heated and complex, I think. Well, you know something, it's, I'll get, tell you something interesting about abortion and viewers can check me on this. You don't hear much from bioethicists anymore about abortion. You used to, but not anymore. People have settled opinions. They're pro-choice, they're pro-life. 
most of the argument now is so heated because it's just a political fight. It's mm. not about ethics. They've settled their views. The yeah. pro-life people have their position. They're not looking at it individually because it, no. it's, it's complex. There's so many different if, cases. If I said to people, yeah. look, um, abortions are done for many reasons. At the far end, people use abortion as birth control. I think that's wrong. I don't like that. I don't want to encourage that. Right. At the other end, there are people who say, my baby is going to be born dead. It's already uh, mm -hmm. failing in, in my womb. Don't you think I should abort this pregnancy and get the chance to start sooner? I think mm -hmm. most people say, yeah, well, that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, putting aside rape and incest and all that, there are different kinds of pregnancies and different uses that abortion goes to. But at this point, it's all political. It's just like yeah. before you're against it. And that's right. a, the new rather than it being a health a healthcare issue yeah. to discuss with their doctor and yeah. family. And, and with all the little nuances, you know, of yeah. We're trying not to have another kid with a horrible disease and it looks like it's going to be through genetic testing horrible. Yeah. And no one's going to argue that it isn't horrible, you know. Mm -hmm. But that you don't hear that much anymore. Yeah. So another issue in reproductive technology is regarding consent. I saw in an interview how you can take the sperm from a dead body, a dead man's body and ha have a baby in vitro afterwards. But then if he didn't consent to it, then that is a huge bioethical issue. We actually have a whole project in this area studying getting uh, gametes, sperm and egg from dead people because it's also possible now to freeze eggs. And so for mm -hmm. the first time you could do what you just described from a woman, mm -hmm. pull her ovary out, try to extract eggs post-death, freeze them, or in, you could try to fertilize them rapidly too if she had a husband or partner. Mm -hmm. So most of the IVF programs, infertility programs around the world don't have a policy. Whether they'll do it, would you do it for a single uh, mom? Would you do it for a man who uh, had filled out something before he went? Uh, most U.S. troops are now asked to consent to this before they deploy. Israeli ones are too. So that's an interesting shift. Wow. But then they could, there's still other issues like, do I get to use the sperm sample for one baby, mm -hmm. five babies? Mm -hmm. If I don't use it, can I give it to my sister? If I don't use it, can I freeze it forever and use it for my grandchildren and on and on and on. So, yeah. but this is an area I think where we can get some answers. It sounds complicated, but it's mm -hmm. possible to sort of say, look, if you're not married or you weren't in a long-term relationship, then you can't say, I want the sperm. Say a big celebrity dies and his fans show up and say, I want to have <laughs> his baby. It was like, no, you, you don't have any prior relationship. You can't do this. Yeah. Another interesting case around this is um, like sperm banks where you have like one man fathering like a hundred kids and then they're out there and don't know that they're dating their brother and sister. And it just is a big mess. <laughs> just had a case in Vermont where I was the expert witness where a doctor did exactly that, although I'm not sure hundreds, but at oh, least. Oh, yeah many and uh some of the women found out that he was the dad using 23 and me the uh genetic oh, test yeah. which came back and said there's this guy whose relatives are your relatives and like who's this guy yeah. and the case was in vermont it's a small rural area there is a danger that people would intermarry unawares because they're kind of all in little towns it's not that populated Mm -hmm. And so we had a trial and he just lost his license for doing this. Now he did he it should. probably 30 years ago. And his defense was there are no rules okay. if I wanted to use myself. So here's an interesting area. People may say, I'm the bioethicist. What am I doing at this guy's trial? I'm trying to argue not that I think it's wrong because that's what judges and juries do. I'm saying here's was the ethical expectation for informed consent 30 years ago. So I had yeah. to know the literature, mm. say, even 30 years ago, you can't say, well, I'm going to use art as a donor and then use yourself. Mm -hmm. That violates informed consent. So that's mm -hmm. basically the expertise there can be, what was the consensus at time X about doing this? Yeah, oh, fascinating. Um, another interesting leading issue I think we see in bioethics is Extending the longevity of our lifetimes. There's people that say, hey, I want to live to be 120, 130. So how are we going to support that, you know, um, system? It becomes a huge philosophical and bioethical issue, I assume. 
What are your thoughts on that? Huge issue there too. I sometimes tell my friends, if there may, if I could live to 120, but I had to go to faculty meetings at NYU, <laughs> no, not for me. Uh, let me go. I don't want to do that. Um, for those who don't know, those can be pretty dreary. Um, generally speaking, people forget something. If you looked at us compared to Roman era, we've already doubled our lifespan. And we had to make a huge number of adjustments. Here's things that the Romans mm-hmm. never had. Retirement, second career. Um, they never had leisure, particularly. You had to kind of work and die. Mm-hmm. They didn't have adolescence. They didn't really have childhood. As soon as you could run around to do something, you mm-hmm. started working or you were mm-hmm. slave or something. Mm-hmm. So it may be that if we're going to live to 120, we have to start to think about things like two retirements or second, third, fourth careers, things like that. But I'll tell you, the biggest issue in life extension is, am I going to extend my life and then just become somebody with Alzheimer's or someone who's frail, or am I going to be healthy? There's almost nobody I ever talked to who says, let me live to 120 demented. Mm-hmm. So it's not just life extension, it's with quality of life. Quality. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so one big issue, obviously, is the organ donation and transplant um, bioethical issue. We all, everybody knows somebody who needs a liver or a kidney or a pancreas, or maybe one day will need one. So this is an issue for everyone. So I know other countries have different ways of going about it, and we definitely have a shortage in this country. Should we re- visit that and maybe adopt maybe the European model? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? So there are about 100,000 people waiting for organs. Last year, we did about 40,000 transplants. A lot of people die. They don't get a transplant. Yeah. We have to do better. Normally, we rely on people who die to make a gift. And I think that's worked okay. I think we should be more aggressive about that, meaning Instead of saying, hey, did you ever think about wanting to do this? We might approach and say, most people want to do this. Is there any reason you don't? That's Mm -hmm. shifting the default from it's a completely generous, heroic thing to more like it's an expected thing, even though you can say no, um, but you change what we call the ethical valence. So I favor that. It doesn't mean you can't say no. You still could. You're just sort of saying better to, it's like eat your vegetables. I'm gonna put them on the plate first before I show you dessert. Um, So other things, we're trying to come up with artificial organs. People are building artificial lungs. People are building artificial pancreas. Kidneys. And at NYU, we just used a pig organ. For the Mm -hmm. first time, we didn't put it in somebody, but we put it on a dead body to see if it would work. That was controversial. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that was my idea to use the dead body. So ethicists sometimes, (laughs) get involved and we got permission from the family and we put the pig kidney into this dead person for about 24 hours to study whether it would be rejected. But animals that are genetically changed using CRISPR we talked about before could start to become the source breeding pigs and have a lot of organs. So yes, I think we need to do more to encourage organ donation. I think we need to look at mechanical organs. We do have kidney dialysis and that helps a lot of people. And then maybe animal, engineered animals might become a source too. Mm-hmm. Elisa, by the way, I got to go pretty soon. So yes. Yeah. So last question, is there anything else um, in the field of bioethics that we need to know or that you would like to share? Well, I think the other big area is not what I'm doing, but my students are interested is climate. Okay. So ethically, how much can you ask people to do in order to protect their health. Should Mm -hmm. they stop eating meat? Should we all grow vegetables on the roof of buildings? You have a health system that was set up not to deal with catastrophes. We see hospitals flooded out. Do we need to shift how we build them and uh, how we get ready for climate disasters? Should we genetically engineer ourselves to be able to withstand more pollutants down the road? Mm. Um, Should we genetically engineer our animals so they make less pollution Mm -hmm. down the road? Um, Mm -hmm. So that's a hot area. Uh, Sorry, no pun intended. It's a a very uh, dynamic area. A lot of students are interested in it. It brings together a new group, environmental people, climate scientists, and the ethics crowd. That's, That's a new 
interdisciplinary uh, exchange. Yeah, and so I mean, the, the people that would be maybe counter arguing the some of these uh, environmental issues is it because they want to go more the natural route? And Sometimes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, and then others simply say, look. It's a little bit like COVID. We can't do all these changes and keep the economy going. So we'll leave those problems for the next generation or the one after that, but we're not gonna stop using oil and gas because we don't, it's just gonna crush the economy of Texas or it's mm -hmm. gonna ruin Russia or something like that. You can't tip these countries over. There are also big fights just about rationing like water. Water is a big issue. You can see it in the US and the West as states fight over the Colorado. Middle East is like going to be more divided by water than religion pretty soon as they fight yeah. about that. So those are areas where the ethics crowd can come in and sort of say, well, here's the fairest distribution. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, this has been very interesting and I sure do Great. appreciate having you on here and, you know, just kind of picking your brain on this because you're an expert in this and one of the leading bioethicists. So I feel very honored that you took the time to be on my channel today. Happy to come. Thanks for the Thank good you. questions. You bet. Um, if you guys like this video, be sure and give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share and subscribe and hit the bell to be alerted to when the next video drops. Thanks, Dr. Kaplan. Bye.